If you have read the Bible before or have noted in most Christian books before Jesus Christ was born, there was a certain man, a Roman emperor ruling the Roman Empire, who ordered that census should be taken. The name of this emperor is Caesar Augustus. Here is the quotation in which he was mentioned, Luke chapter 2 verses 1 to 3. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. While he is only mentioned once in scripture, Caesar Augustus plays a pivotal role in the account of the birth of Jesus of Nazareth. Unbeknownst to him, when Augustus issued a decree that the census be taken, he was helping fulfill a prophecy written 600 years earlier that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, Micah 5.2. Augustus, also called Augustus Caesar, or Octavian, whose original name was Gaius Octavius, was born September 23, 63 BC, and died August 19, 14 CE, Nola, near Naples, Italy. He was adopted by Julius Caesar. Later, he was given the full name of Gaius Julius Caesar Octavianus. He was the first Roman emperor following the Republic, which had been finally destroyed by the dictatorship of Julius Caesar, his great uncle and adoptive father. His autocratic regime is known as the Principate because he was the princep, the first citizen, at the head of that array of outwardly revived Republican institutions that alone made his autocracy palatable. With unlimited patience, skill, and efficiency, he overhauled every aspect of Roman life and brought durable peace and prosperity to the Greco-Roman world. Now let's dive deep into the history of this man and how he reshaped the Roman Empire. Gaius Octavius was of a prosperous family that had long been settled at Velletre, Velletri, southeast of Rome. His father, who died in 59 BCE, had been the first of the family to become a Roman senator and was elected to the high annual office of the praetorship, which ranked second in the political hierarchy to the consulship. Gaius Octavius' mother, Atia, was the daughter of Julia, the sister of Julius Caesar, and it was Caesar who launched the young Octavius into Roman public life. At age 12, he made his debut by delivering the funeral speech for his grandmother, Julia. Three or four years later, he received the coveted membership of the Board of Priests, Pontifices. In 46 BCE, he accompanied Caesar, now dictator, in his triumphal procession after his victory in Africa over his opponents in the Civil War. And in the following year, in spite of ill health, he joined the dictator in Spain. He was at Apollonia, now in Albania, completing his academic and military studies when, in 44 BCE, he learned that Julius Caesar had been murdered. His physical condition was subject to a host of ills and weaknesses, many of them recurrent. Indeed, in his early life, particularly, it was only his indomitable will that enabled him to survive, a strange preliminary to an unprecedented and unequaled life's work. His appearance is described by the biographer Suetonius as this. He was unusually handsome and exceedingly graceful at all periods of his life, though he cared nothing for personal adornment. His expression, whether in conversation or when he was silent, was calm and mild. He had clear, bright eyes, in which he liked to have it thought that there was a kind of divine power, and it greatly pleased him whenever he looked keenly at anyone, if he let his face fall as if before the radiance of the sun. His teeth were wide apart, small and ill-kept. His hair was slightly curly and inclining to golden. His eyebrows met. His complexion was between dark and fair. He was short of stature, but this was concealed by the fine proportion and symmetry of his figure and was noticeable only by comparison with some taller person standing beside him. Upon his return to Italy, he received the surprising news that Julius Caesar, in his will, had posthumously adopted him as his son and designated him as his chief heir. At the tender age of 18, despite the counsel of his stepfather and others advising caution, he boldly accepted this perilous inheritance and set forth for Rome. Mark Antony, Caesar's most trusted confidant who had taken control of Caesar's assets and documents and had expected to be the primary beneficiary, adamantly refused to release any of Caesar's funds. This compelled Octavius to use his own resources to fulfill Caesar's bequests to the Roman populace. Meanwhile, Caesar's assassins, 
Marcus Junius Brutus and Gaius Cassius Longinus paid little heed to Octavius and retreated to the eastern provinces. Cicero, the renowned orator and one of Rome's eminent statesmen, had hoped to manipulate Octavius for his own purposes, but severely underestimated his capabilities. Octavius initiated public games, originally established by Caesar, in a bid to win favor with the Roman citizens. Through these events, he successfully garnered the support of a significant portion of Caesar's former troops. Encouraged by Cicero, the Senate severed ties with Mark Antony and turned to Octavius for assistance, even granting him the status of a senator despite his youth. They united in the campaign against Antony and Mutina, Modena, ultimately forcing Antony to withdraw to Gaul. Following the demise of the consuls commanding the Senate's forces, Octavius's soldiers pressured the Senate to bestow upon him an unoccupied consulship. It was under the name Gaius Julius Caesar that he secured formal recognition as Caesar's adopted son. Though notably, he chose not to append Octavianus to his name, reflecting his original family lineage. However, history now commonly refers to him as Octavian until the later adoption of the title Augustus. Soon after, Octavian managed to broker an agreement with Mark Antony and Marcus Aemilius Lepidus, another key supporter of Caesar who had assumed the role of chief priest. On November 27, 43 BCE, the three of them were officially appointed as triumvirs for a five-year dictatorship aimed at restoring order to the state. This marked the establishment of the second triumvirate, the first having been an informal alliance between Pompey, Crassus, and Julius Caesar. While the eastern provinces were under the control of Brutus and Cassius, the triumvirs divided the western territories among themselves. They compiled a list of proscribed political enemies, leading to the execution of around 300 senators, including Cicero, a prominent adversary of Antony, and approximately 2,000 members of the equestrian class below the senators. In January 42 BCE, Julius Caesar was officially recognized as a god of the Roman state, enhancing Octavian's prestige as the son of a deity. Octavian and Antony, despite some differences, crossed the Adriatic and, led by Antony due to Octavian's illness, emerged victorious in the two battles of Philippi against Brutus and Cassius, both of whom committed suicide. Antony, as the senior member of the Triumvirate, assumed control of the eastern provinces and Gaul, while Octavian returned to Italy. There, he became embroiled in the Perusine War, which was ultimately resolved in his favor in Perusia, modern-day Perugia, against Antony's brother and wife. To placate another potential adversary, Sextus Pompeius, the son of Pompey the Great, who had seized Sicily and control over important sea routes, Octavian married Sextus's relative Scribonia, though he later divorced her due to personal differences. These family ties did not deter Sextus from exploring overtures with Antony after the Perusine War, but Antony declined, and instead reached a new understanding with Octavian at the Treaty of Brundisium. According to the terms of the treaty, Octavian was granted control over the entire western region, except for Africa, which Lepidus was allowed to retain. Italy, although ostensibly neutral ground, was effectively under Octavian's authority. The eastern provinces were once again designated for Antony, and it was arranged that he would marry Octavian's sister, Octavia. The people of the Roman Empire were elated by the treaty, as it appeared to signal an end to the years of civil strife. In 38 BCE, Octavian further solidified his standing with the Roman aristocracy by marrying Livia Drusilla. But a reconciliation with Sextus Pompeius proved abortive, and Octavian was soon plunged into serious warfare against him. When his first operations against Sextus's Sicilian bases proved disastrous, he felt obliged to make a new compact with Antony at Tarentum, Taranto, in 37 BCE. Antony was to provide Octavian with ships, in return for troops Antony needed for his forthcoming war against the empire's eastern neighbor Parthia and its Median allies. Antony handed over the ships, but Octavian never sent the troops. The treaty also provided for the renewal of the Second Triumvirate for five years, until the end of 33 BCE. Now let's into the military successes of Augustus. In the subsequent year, there was a shift in the balance of power. 
Antony's eastern expedition encountered failure, while Octavian's fleet, under the command of his former schoolmate Marcus Agrippa, who, despite being unpopular with the influential nobles, proved to be a brilliant admiral, decisively defeated Sextus Pompeius off Cape Nolocus, Venetico, in Sicily. At this juncture, the third triumvir, Lepidus, who sought to challenge Octavian's dominance in the West through force, was disarmed by Octavian, stripped of his triumviral authority, and compelled into retirement. Octavian, ignoring Antony's claim to settle his veterans in Italy and recruit new troops, discharged many of his legionaries and established colonies for them. His overt competition with Antony for eventual control of the Roman world became increasingly evident. Octavian's marriage two years prior had started to win over some of the nobles who had previously supported Antony. He also initiated an extensive campaign of religious and patriotic propaganda, centered around the classical god of order, Apollo. In contrast to Antony's association with the less Roman deity, Dionysus, Bacchus. Additionally, Octavian began to prefix his name with the title Imperator, signifying himself as the supreme commander. Gradually, although he continued to exercise his triumviral powers, he omitted any reference to them from his coinage, instead focusing on the simple and emotive title, Caesar son of a god. However, in order to compete with Antony's military seniority, Octavian needed foreign conquests. Between 35 and 33 BCE, he engaged in three successive campaigns in Illyricum and Dalmatia, parts of modern Slovenia and Croatia, to safeguard the northeastern borders of Italy. With the assistance of Agrippa, he also invested significant resources in beautifying Rome. When Octavian stirred public outcry against Antony's territorial grants to Cleopatra, it became evident that a clash between the two leaders was imminent. In 32 BCE, the triumvirate officially dissolved, and Octavian, unlike Antony, claimed not to be using its powers any longer. Amid a fierce exchange of propaganda, Antony divorced Octavia, which prompted her brother Octavian to seize Antony's will and allege that it contained damning evidence of Cleopatra's influence over him. Each leader persuaded the populations under their sway to swear allegiance to their respective causes. Then, despite significant discontent provoked by his actions in Italy, Octavian declared war, not against Antony, but against Cleopatra. With Cleopatra by his side, Antony had positioned his fleet and army to defend strong points along the coast of western Greece. However, in 31 BCE, Octavian dispatched Agrippa early in the year to capture Methone at the country's southwestern tip, catching his enemies off guard. After Octavian's arrival, he and Agrippa successfully trapped Antony's fleet within the Gulf of Ambracia, Arta. During the Battle of Actium, Antony attempted to extricate his ships in hopes of continuing the fight elsewhere. While Cleopatra and Antony managed to escape, only a fraction of their fleet followed them. Cleopatra and Antony fled to Egypt and took their own lives when Octavian captured the country the following year. Octavian executed Cleopatra's son, Ptolemy, 15th Caesar, Caesarion, whom she claimed was fathered by Caesar. He annexed Egypt and retained direct control over it, thanks in part to seizing Cleopatra's treasure, which enabled him to pay off his veterans and solidify his mastery over the entire Greco-Roman world. From this point onward, through a gradual series of cautious and patient measures, Octavian established the Roman Principate, a system of government that allowed him to maintain near-absolute control. He progressively reduced his 60 legions to 28, retaining approximately 150,000 legionaries, mostly of Italian origin, and supplemented them with a similar number of auxiliaries recruited from the provinces. Octavian established a permanent bodyguard, the Praetorians, with detachments stationed in Rome and other Italian towns. He created an extensive network of roads to maintain internal order and facilitate trade, while organizing an efficient fleet to police the Mediterranean. In 28 BCE, Octavian and Agrippa conducted a census of the civilian population, the first of three during his reign. They also reduced the Senate's size from about 1,000 to 800, later 600, pliable members, and Octavian was appointed its president. 
the governance and administrative structure of Octavian. Remembering, however, that Caesar had been assassinated because of his resort to naked power, Octavian realized that the governing class would welcome him as the terminator of civil war only if he concealed his autocracy beneath provisions avowedly harking back to Republican traditions. From 31 until 23, BCE, the constitutional basis of his power, remained a continuous succession of consulships. But in January 27, BCE, he ostensibly transferred the state to the free disposal of the Senate and people, earning the misleading, though outwardly plausible, tribute that he had restored the Republic. At the same time, he was granted a 10-year tenure of an area of government, provincia, comprising Spain, Gaul, and Syria, the three regions containing the bulk of the army. The remaining provinces were to be governed by proconsuls appointed by the Senate in the old Republican fashion. Octavian, however, believed that his supreme prestige, crystallized in the meaningful term octoritas, safeguarded him against any defiance by these personages, and he was indeed able, more or less indirectly, to influence their appointments, just as he was able, on the rare occasions when he regarded it as desirable, to influence the appointments to the consulships and other metropolitan offices that continued to exist in Republican fashion. Four days after these measures, his name Caesar, acquired through adoption in Julius's will, was supplemented by Augustus, an appellation with an antique religious ring, believed to be linked etymologically with Octoritas and with the ancient practice of augury. The word Augustus was often contrasted with Humanus, its adoption as the title representing the new order cleverly indicated, in an extra-constitutional fashion, his superiority over the rest of mankind. With the aid of writers such as Virgil, Livy and Horace, all of whom in their different ways shared the same ideas, he showed his patriotic veneration of the old Italian faith by reviving many of its ceremonials and repairing numerous temples. Military operations continued in many frontier areas. In 25 BCE, recalcitrant Alpine tribes were reduced, and Galatia, Central Asia Minor, was annexed. Mauritania, on the other hand, was transferred from Roman provincial status to that of a client kingdom, for such dependent monarchies as in the later Republic bore a considerable part of the burden of imperial defense. Augustus himself visited Gaul and directed part of a campaign in Spain until his health gave out. In 23 BCE, he fell ill again and seemed on the point of death. Feeling, amid reports of conspiracies, that new constitutional steps were necessary, he proceeded to terminate his series of consulships in favor of a power that was separated altogether from office and its practical inconveniences. This power raised him above the proconsuls. It was never referred to on the official coinage or in Augustus's political testament, but was intended to be exercised mainly in emergencies and on personal visits. He was also awarded the power of a tribune for life. Earlier, he had accepted certain privileges of a tribune. The full power he now assumed carried with it practical advantages, notably the right to convene the Senate. But, more particularly, the office of a tribune surrounded him with a democratic aura because of the ancient character of the annually elected tribunes of the people as defenders of the plebs. This was perhaps needed all the more because Augustus himself, while admittedly supporting the interests of poorer people by a great extension of the right of judicial appeal, tended to back the established classes as the keystone of his system. Agrippa, too, was granted superiority over proconsuls, presumably in order to ensure that the armies would be in safe hands in case one of Augustus's recurrent illnesses proved fatal. The next to die, however, was the emperor's young nephew Marcus Claudius Marcellus, who had been married to his daughter Julia and might eventually have been envisaged as his successor. In the same year, 23 BCE, Agrippa was sent out to the east as deputy princeps. Two years later, he became Julia's second husband. Meanwhile, Augustus himself traveled in Sicily, Greece, and Asia. Important reorganizations were put into effect wherever he went, and immense satisfaction was caused by an agreement in 20 BCE with Parthia, under which the Parthians recognized Rome's protectorate over Armenia and returned the legionary standards captured from Crassus 33 years earlier. In 19 BCE, Agrippa completed the subjugation of Spain. In this year, 
there was some adjustment of Octavian's powers to allow him to exercise them more freely in Italy, and the two following years witnessed social legislation attempting to encourage marriage, regulate penalties for adultery, and reduce extravagance. In 17, there were resplendent celebrations of ancient ritual known as the Secular Games to purify the Roman people of their past sins and provide full religious inauguration of the New Age. The Secular Games, known as the Ludi Secularis in Latin, were a series of religious and cultural celebrations held in ancient Rome. These games were significant events that marked the end of one speculum, a period of time roughly equivalent to a human lifespan, and the beginning of the next. The secular games were celebrated once every seculum, and they were meant to purify and renew the state's spiritual and moral well-being. Here is how the secular games were conducted in the Roman Empire. The games were held to coincide with the beginning of a new saculum, which was believed to occur every 110 years. They were carefully timed to align with specific astronomical and astrological conditions, emphasizing their significance. The secular games involve various religious ceremonies and sacrifices to appease the gods and seek their favor for the upcoming saculum. These rites were supervised by Roman priests, and the rituals included offerings, prayers, and incantations. In addition to the religious aspects, the games included a series of public entertainments, such as theatrical performances, chariot races, and other spectacles. These events were held in public spaces like the Circus Maximus and the Colosseum. The games were attended by a large portion of the Roman population and participation was encouraged from all social classes. The events aimed to unify the people and promote a sense of communal identity. One of the most famous features of the secular games was the performance of the Carmen Secular, a hymn written by the poet Horace, which was sung by a choir of boys and girls during the celebration. The hymn celebrated the virtues of the ruling emperor, Augustus, and highlighted the hopes for the new seculum. Special commemorative coins were minted for the occasion, which featured the name of the reigning emperor and images associated with the games. The secular games were often used as a platform for imperial propaganda, promoting the emperor's role in preserving the Roman state's traditional values and religious practices. The secular games lasted for several days, with festivities and ceremonies taking place throughout the celebration. The secular games were a complex and multifaceted event, combining religious piety, public entertainment, and imperial symbolism. They were an important part of the cultural and religious life of ancient Rome and served to reinforce the idea of continuity and renewal in the Roman state. Although the Principate was not an office which could be automatically handed on, Augustus seemed to be indicating his views regarding his ultimate successor when he adopted the two sons of his daughter Julia, boys aged three and one, who were henceforward known as Gaius Caesar and Lucius Caesar. Their father, Agrippa, whose powers had been renewed along with his masters, returned to the east. But now Augustus also gave important employment to his stepsons, his wife, Livia's sons by her former marriage, Tiberius and Drusus the Elder. Proceeding across the Alps, they annexed Noricum and Raetia, comprising large parts of what are now Switzerland, Austria, and Bavaria, and extended the imperial frontier from Italy to the Upper Danube, 1615 BCE. It was probably during these years that an executive or drafting committee, concilium, of the Senate was established in order to help Augustus to prepare senatorial business. His administrative burden was also lightened by the expansion of his own staff, knights who could also now rise to a number of key posts and freedmen to form the beginnings of a civil service which had never existed before but was destined to become an essential feature of the imperial system gradually too a completely reformed administrative structure of rome italy and the whole empire was evolved the financial system that made this possible was evidently far more effective than anything the empire had ever seen until then the system was based on the central treasury, Aerarium, but the details of its relationship with the treasuries of the provinces, and particularly the Provincia of Augustus, are still imperfectly understood. Partly because, although the emperor proudly recorded his gifts to the central treasury, he did not report what funds passed in the opposite direction. The taxation providing these resources apparently included two main direct taxes, a poll tax, 
tributum capitis, paid in some provinces by all adults and in others by adult males only, and a land tax, tributum soli. There were also indirect taxes, which, as in the past, were farmed out to contractors because their yield was unpredictable and the embryonic civil service lacked the resources to handle them. The Republican customs dues continued, but the rates were low enough not to hamper trade, which, in the peaceful conditions created by Augustus, flourished in wholly unprecedented fashion. Industries did not exist on a very large scale, but commerce was greatly stimulated by a sweeping reform and expansion of the Roman coinage, gold and silver pieces, their designs reflecting many facets of imperial publicity, were issued in great quantities at a number of widely distributed mints. The Rome Mint was reopened for this purpose about 20 BCE. The absence of bronze token coinage, which had been sparse for many decades, was remedied by the creation of abundant mintages in yellow orichalcum and red copper. In the West, the principal mint for these pieces besides Rome was Lugdunum, lion, whose coins displayed a view of the altar of Rome and Augustus that formed a model for other provincial capitals. The Roman citizen colonies of the West, many of them established by Augustus to settle his veterans, supplemented this output by their own local coinages. And in the East, particularly Asia Minor and Syria, numerous Greek cities were also allowed to issue small change. Here is how he expanded the empire. The death in 12 BCE of Lepidus enabled Augustus finally to succeed him as the official head of the Roman religion, the chief priest, Pontifex Maximus. In the same year, Agrippa, too, died. Augustus compelled his widow, Julia, to marry Tiberius against both their wishes. During the next three years, however, Tiberius was away in the field, reducing Pannonia up to the Middle Danube, while his brother Drusus crossed the Rhine frontier and invaded Germany as far as the Elbe, where he died in 9 BCE. In the following year, Augustus lost another of his intimates, Mecenas, who had been the advisor of his early days and was an outstanding patron of letters. Tiberius, who replaced Drusus in Germany, was elevated in 6 BCE to a share in his stepfather's tribunician power, but shortly afterward he went into retirement on the island of Rhodes. This was attributed to jealousy of his stepnephew Gaius Caesar, who was introduced to public life with a great fanfare in the following year, and the same compliments were paid to his brother Lucius in Sua BCE, the year in which Augustus received his climactic title, Father of the Country, Pater Patriae. Gaius was sent to the east and Lucius to the west. Both, however, soon died. Tiberius returned home and in 4 CE, Augustus adopted him as his son, who in turn was required to adopt Germanicus, the son of his brother Drusus. The powers conferred upon Tiberius made him almost Augustus' own equal in everything except prestige. Tiberius's next task was to consolidate the invasion and provincial organization of Germany, 4 to 5 CE. An invasion of Bohemia was planned and had already been launched from two directions when news came in 6 that Pannonia and Illyricum had revolted. It took three years for the rebellion to be put down, and this had only just been completed when Arminius raised the Germans against their Roman governor Varus and destroyed him and his three legions. As Augustus could not readily replace the troops, the annexation of Western Germany and Bohemia was postponed indefinitely. Tiberius and Germanicus were sent to consolidate the Rhine frontier. Although Augustus was now feeling his age, these years in association with Tiberius were marked by administrative innovations. The annexation of Judea in 6 CE, its client King Herod the Great had died 10 years previously. The establishment at Rome in the same year of a fire brigade with police duties, supplemented seven years later by a regular police force, Cohortes Urbani, the creation of a military treasury, Aerarium Militare, to defray soldiers' retirement bounties from taxes, and the conversion of the hitherto occasional appointment of Prefect of the City, Praefectus Urbi, into a permanent office, 13 CE. When in the same year the powers of Augustus were renewed for 10 years, such renewals had been granted at intervals throughout the reign. Tiberius was made his equal in every constitutional respect. 
In April, Augustus deposited his will at the House of the Vestals in Rome. It included a summary of the military and financial resources of the empire, Breviarium Totius Imperi, and his political testament, known as the Res Gestae Divi Augusti, Achievements of the Divine Augustus. The best preserved copy of the latter document is on the walls of the Temple of Rome and Augustus at Ankara, Turkey, the Monumentum Ancyron. In 14 CE, Tiberius was due to leave for Illyricum, but was recalled by the news that Augustus was gravely ill. He died on August 19th, and on September 17th, the Senate enrolled him among the gods of the Roman state. By that time, Tiberius had succeeded him as the second Roman emperor, though the formalities involved in the succession proved embarrassing, both to himself and to the Senate because the Principate of Augustus had not, constitutionally speaking, been heritable or continuous. Like other emperors, Tiberius assumed the designation Augustus as an additional title of his own. Agrippa Postumus, who had been named his co heir but was later banished, was put to death. The order to kill him may already have been given by Augustus, but this is not certain. Now let's look at the notable personality and achievements of Augustus. Augustus was one of the great administrative geniuses of history. The gigantic work of reorganization that he carried out in every field of Roman life and throughout the entire empire says it all. Augustus was a highly skilled and shrewd politician. He was adept at navigating the complex and often treacherous political landscape of the late Roman Republic. His ability to form alliances, manipulate the Senate, and maintain public support contributed to his rise to power. Augustus is often credited with founding the Roman Empire and the Principate, a system of government in which he held the power and authority of an emperor while officially preserving the institutions of the Roman Republic. This new system brought stability and effectively ended the era of civil wars and political chaos. Under Augustus's rule, the Roman Empire experienced a period of relative peace and stability known as the Pax Romana, Roman peace. His diplomatic and military efforts, including border fortifications, ensured security along the empire's frontiers, leading to prosperity and economic growth. Augustus implemented numerous social and cultural reforms. He encouraged family values and promoted marriage and procreation, even enacting laws to incentivize marriage and childbearing. He was also a patron of the arts and literature, supporting poets like Virgil and Horace. Augustus was skilled at managing his public image and used art, literature, and inscriptions to promote his achievements and the virtues of the new order. He presented himself as a restorer of traditional Roman values and the savior of the Roman state. He conducted military campaigns that expanded the empire's borders and consolidated its control. He annexed Egypt, subjugated the Alpine tribes, and engaged in campaigns in Spain and other regions, effectively expanding the empire. Augustus reformed the Roman administrative system. He established the Praetorian Guard as a personal bodyguard, reorganized the Roman legions, and oversaw the construction of roads and other infrastructure projects. He portrayed himself as a pious leader who restored the Roman religious traditions and ceremonies. He linked his rule to the favor of the gods and was officially recognized as a god himself after his death. Augustus left a lasting legacy on the Roman Empire. His model of governance, known as the Augustan Principate, influenced future Roman emperors. Augustus's countenance proved a godsend to the Greeks and Hellenized Easterners, who were the best sculptors of the time, for they elevated his features into a moving, never-to-be-forgotten imperial type, which Napoleon's artists, among others, keenly emulated. The contemporary portrait busts of Augustus echoed on his coins formed part of a significant renaissance of the arts in which Italic and Hellenic styles were discreetly and brilliantly blended. Still extant at Rome are the severe yet delicate reliefs of the Ara Passus, Altar of Peace, depicting a religious procession in which the national leaders are taking part. There are also scenes from the Roman mythology. The altar was dedicated by the Senate and people of Rome in 13 BCE to commemorate the pacification of Gaul and Spain. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to subscribe to never miss an update when we upload new videos like this one. Also, you can check out our other videos showing on the end screen now. See you in the next one.